Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight I'm continuing the study on early church heresies. This is part two. If you didn't see part one, it's uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, I have uh, Brother Ted here with me tonight. Uh, his YouTube channel is uh, God's Truth Ministries, and uh, I hope you will subscribe to him. He is having some technical problems, so hopefully it'll work out, but if not, he'll be there just listening, I guess. Um, okay, I'm going to um, pick up where I left off last time, and the next heresy I want to discuss, um, it is, um, let me see. Uh, okay, so far I, I did discuss, um, let me just mention them briefly here, uh, Judaizers, Marcionism, Docetism, Gnosticism, Adoptionism, Manichaeism, Origenism, um, Monarchism, Sibelianism, and Modalism, which are three names for the same thing. Now, my, the next one will be Apollinarianism. So let me continue with uh, that, uh, discussing that one. Um, this is, uh, began... I guess Apollinarius was the one that this is named after, and he lived between 310 and 390 AD. It says this heretical doctrine uh, was originated by Apollinarius, a bishop of Laodicea in Asia Minor. He held that Christ had a human body, but only a sensitive soul and no rational human mind or human free will. These having been replaced in Christ by the divine logos or word of God. This theory was condemned by the Roman Synod in 377 and 381 uh, by the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople. Uh, so this is kind of a strange one, I think. It's, um, um, the idea is basically that See, what, the way we understand this um, Godhead and the deity and humanity of Christ is that Jesus is fully God. He is eternal. He's not a creature. Uh, and, and, and yet he is fully man. But Apollinarianism denies the, the full humanity of Jesus. They could not accept that he could be completely human uh, because they... They say that his mind had to still be the logos. He didn't have a human mind. Now, to me, this is, uh, I don't know, some of these things that are declared heresies, uh, uh, I, I think that some of them are very, very serious, and some of them are minor, and they're almost a matter of nuances. But uh, this one, to me, is not uh, uh, something that I think everybody should be that shook up about. But let me just read a little bit about... Uh, uh, more about, uh, uh, see if there's something else I can find out about it here. Yeah, it says, belief that Jesus had a human body and lower soul, the seed of his emotions, but a divine mind. Apollinaris further taught that the souls of men were propagated by other souls as well as their bodies. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I, it's not that complicated and yet it to me i don't doesn't strike me as really that serious if someone said to me today and I, we've never heard of apollinarius that uh they think that uh yeah jesus is eternal god almighty he's he, he's completely god and yet he's, he has humanity and he does have a human body but his mind is still the mind of god I, i'm just not gonna you know uh throw up the red flags and say Woo, watch it i can't handle that I don't, <laughs> I just don't know why that one is, uh, even though it was declared as a heresy, it doesn't seem to me. I know it was not a real popular widespread heresy. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next, next one on my list. And this is the one that is probably uh, number, number probably two, one or two on my list as far as the seriousness. And this is Arianism. And this, uh, really it was popularized in the fourth century 
uh, a major heresy that arose in the fourth century and denied the divinity of Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, first effectively advanced by Arius, who lived 256 to 336 AD, a priest of Alexandria who denied that there were three distinct divine persons in God. Arius, uh, there, uh, for Arius, there was only one person, the Father. According to Arian theory, the Son was created. The, uh, quote, there was a time when he was not, unquote. That's the famous line from Arius, uh, claiming that Jesus did have a beginning. Uh, Christ was thus a son of God, not by nature, but only by grace and adoption. And that is, it's not exactly adoptionism, adoptionism as we discussed earlier, but it accomplishes the same thing. It uh, denies the eternality of Jesus. Uh, this theory logically evacuates the doctrine of the incarnation of God in Christ of all meaning if God did not become a man then the world has not been redeemed and the faith itself eventually dissolves Arianism was formally condemned in 325 by the Council of Nicaea uh, which formulated and propagated the or original version of the Nicene Creed but Arianism and semi-Arianism uh, continued to prevail in its original form in many areas for more than a century um, now, the reason Arianism is such a serious problem is because if, if Arius was correct and Jesus had a beginning, his, his quote was, there was a time when he was not. That means Jesus is not eternal. God, who he calls the Father, God is eternal. Jesus had a beginning and therefore he's a creature and if you understand you know uh, much about the Bible the Bible tells us that uh, God is eternal so therefore Jesus could not be God if he's not eternal if he had a beginning he's not God the Bible tells us that um, uh, only God can be Savior and of course the Bible also says that Jesus is Savior so we, we know from the Bible that Jesus is Savior. He is our Savior God, and he is eternal. And yet in Arianism, uh, this is all impossible because it, he believes that Jesus was a creature. He had a beginning. And if that is the case, then uh, he can't be Savior. He does not have the power to be Savior if he's not eternal God Almighty. So Arianism... Um, and I discussed Sabellianism or, or modalism in the last study. These two are two at far ends of the extreme. In, in the middle, we have the idea that Jesus is, uh, there, there's uh, one God, but three persons, the Father God, the Son God, the Holy Spirit God, and, and yet they're distinct, but and yet still one God. That's triunity or the Trinity. This is what is the norm that most of the Christianity accepts. Now, out of one extreme, outside of that orthodoxy, you have modalism that says there's one God and there's not three distinct persons, there's just three modes of operation. So sometimes God turns into the Son, sometimes he turns into the Holy Spirit, sometimes he turns into the Father. It's just, uh, it's like putting on a mask and being three different people. Um, but that, the, with modalism, their goal was to, to really protect the concept of monotheism because they saw um, uh, if there's three distinct persons, then you are end up being a polytheistic. And, and we know that the Bible teaches it in monotheism, that there's only one God. So modalism came, was started as a way of, of uh, defending monotheism and yet keeping Jesus and the Father and the Son all as God. And so uh, that's that was outside of this uh, orthodoxy that God is triune, three distinct persons, yet one God. Now, now Arianism fell to the other extreme. Instead of, uh, like modalism, claiming that Jesus is God, he in fact is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Arianism, he claims, no, he's not God at all. He's, he's a creature, 
and and uh, he did have a beginning, that would make him no different than an angel or person. Hey, Brother Evan. Hi, can you hear me, brother? I don't have you blo blocked or anything here, or hidden. Okay, we'll talk if you if you feel like saying something. Hey, brother. Hi. Um, have you uh, listened at all? Do you know what I'm talking about yet? I just caught a minute of it. You're talking about Arianism and the belief that Jesus was a created being. We knew, of course, it's absolute nonsense. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I, in the first study on uh, church, early church heresies, I, I covered probably about 10 different heresies, and now we, we've moved on to, uh, we're finally discussing Arianism. And I was comparing... Uh, it, orthodoxy is is, is that uh, there's one God, three persons, yet one God. Father's God, the Son's God, the Holy Spirit's God. They're all fully God, and yet there's one God. Now, how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's various ways of trying to explain it, but most people say, well, this is uh, the triunity of God is a, a mystery. Uh, but then Arianism came along. And the problem with Arianism is it says that Jesus is, is actually a creature. Uh, Arius is famous for the, the line, quote, uh, there was a time when he was not. And that means that he's not eternal. Hmm. Uh, and that means that he's created. And if he's created, he's not an eternal God, and therefore he can't be Savior because only God can be the Savior. So that's the problem with Arianism. And let me, let me get your thoughts on all that. Yeah, absolutely. Christianity is actually dependent upon the fact that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh because uh, also uh, Jesus says, uh, I mean the Old Testament says, God said in uh, Numbers, I believe it was, in Deuteronomy, I know for sure, that he will not uh, punish one for the sin of another. And in Revelation tells us that he, Christ comes to give to each according to their works. Uh, so, uh, so that's each person judged upon themselves, their own sin, their own merits, uh, not uh, not one person for the sin of another. So Jesus can't be a created being because then God will have just have broken His own word, you know, uh, punishing one for the sin of another. And so the only way that Christianity can can be true is if God Himself took on flesh to pay the price for our sins Himself. He couldn't punish some other. That would be unjust, and God's not unjust, obviously. So it, Christianity requires that Jesus Christ be God manifest in the flesh. If it were not so, Christianity is worthless. Yeah. So if Jesus is not God, he could not be Savior, because the Bible says that only God is the Savior. And so... Um, that's why it is essential to understand that Jesus is not a created being. He is eternal God Almighty. Uh, on the other hand, it's also true that if Jesus did not have humanity and a physical body, the way that the Gnostics, the Docetists, and, and Manichaeists, they believe that material world is evil. Therefore, oh, yeah. Jesus did not really have a physical body, and therefore, uh, if, uh, if he didn't have a body, he couldn't have been crucified and he couldn't have been resurrected. Mm -hmm. So uh, both of these heresies destroy Christianity and destroy, destroy our salvation. Without Jesus having a body and without Jesus being mm -hmm. God, we, we don't have a, a Savior God. Amen. All right, Brother Ted is here with us too, but uh, he can't get his um, audio and video to work, but he's listening. Um, I hope we can all get together and talk afterwards, though, uh, somehow, because uh, I want to discuss that other subject uh, between the three of us. We should do a, a broadcast sometime in the future about uh, conditionalism, conditional immortality. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next uh, uh, the next um, heresy on my list here: uh, Donatism. Uh, it's a 4th and 5th century African heresy holding that the validity of the sacraments depends upon the moral character of the minister of the sacraments and that sinners cannot be true members of the church or even tolerated by the church if their sins are publicly known. 
Donatism began as a schism when rigorous claimed that a bishop of Carthage, Sayacillian, uh, I think is his name, was not a true bishop because he had been ordained by a bishop who had been an apostate under Diocletian persecution. The Donatists ordained their own bishops, one of whom was Donatus, uh, for whom the heresy is named. Donatism was condemned in 311 to 314. Uh, but here's the thing about Donatism that I think is has to be put into context here. During the persecutions of Diocl Diocletian, uh, the believers were forced to um, make sacrifices to the Roman gods or be killed. And uh, many of the believers refused to do it and they went on and they, they, they confessed their faith in Jesus instead of denying it. And that was basically a sentence of death and they became martyrs. These confessor, confessors, martyrs, uh, were really highly esteemed uh, people because uh, so many of the people were not willing to confess Jesus when confronted with uh, the threat of death and they would go ahead and make a sacrifice and uh, uh, to and they get a certificate. I forgot what they called it, but they would have a certificate proving. So if the, the Romans asked for proof that they made a sacrifice, they could show them kind of a receipt. Uh, but the problem with this is that the people who they were called lapsed, the people who would not confess Jesus and at the at the cost of their life, they were called lapsers. And the lapsers. Um, uh, after Donatism, I mean, I mean, after Diocletian was gone and the church became accepted and there was no more persecution, the people who had lapsed wanted to come back into the church. Uh, and then the question is, what do we do with the lapsed? And the Donatists, they believed that they would be really strict and they should not be allowed back in. Whereas, um, and there other factions, they thought, no, we need to let them in. There was basically an argument about what kind of a church should we have. Should the church be pure? Anybody who is a lapser or uh, off in some way into sin, they would be uh, kicked out of the church. Or the other faction said, no, the church is not for the pure, the church is for sinners. It's more like a hospital for the sick. And so that was a, an argument in that time in the church history. Uh, should we let the people who have lapsed in and treat them like a sick patient and try to bring them back in and accept them, or should we shun them and, and excommunicate them and forever? Um, so that was the principle of, of uh, uh, donatism, and, and I don't know if you've heard much about it, but what do you think of the concept? How today should we apply that? If, if Should the church be more, if, let's keep it pure. Uh, anybody who's a, a sinner or uh, had a problem with their faith or something, they shouldn't be in the church. Or should we take the attitude that the church is like a hospital and all those people who are messed up one way or another, we welcome them in and we try to help them. Well, which you think is the better approach? Uh, well, personally, I think um, I, I, Jesus came, uh, said... Uh, he came for the for the, the the sinners, not the righteous. And uh, you know, a, a healthy man needs no has no need of a physician. So, uh, th I think the church is for everyone. We're all sinners, and uh, we all, we all need a savior. And, and no matter how engrossed in sin somebody is, I think a problem would arise if somebody was engrossed in some kind of sin or another and we're trying to get other members of the church to follow his ways I think that would be a problem but if somebody comes in because they have an addiction to cigarettes or alcohol or porn or anything else um, that's somebody who needs Jesus what is the church there for if it's not to bring sinner Christ and, and get help from God to overcome sin and whatnot that's the way I see it well, there was something else in the little statement that I read about Donatists that I think that we need to focus on also, and that is that not only did they have to decide how to deal with the lapsed people, but also 
uh, the idea of sacrament. See, uh, even at this point in church history, uh, the how you get saved was completely uh, yeah, heretical so. at this point. Uh, they believed in baptismal regeneration to get saved, and then they believed that when you sin, you needed to confess, and then you need to get the sacraments to get the Holy Spirit back in. And so, uh, this the idea of the sacraments, uh, baptism and and the, the, the Eucharist, it, they elevated these things to such an extent that your salvation hinged upon these sacraments. So that's what they would do is they would deny the sacraments. You know the word excommunicate. A lot of people think that it just means that you are you don't communicate with someone. They're, they're, you're not in communion with them. But it, it really meant uh, at that time it meant uh, no communion for you, no Eucharist for you. And that meant that they couldn't get the Holy Spirit back in, and they're lost if they're denied the Eucharist. So this is the problem, and, uh, and it's all based upon believing, elevating these sacraments to such a level that rather than being something done in remembrance of Jesus, these are something that are done in order to get saved and stay saved. Sounds kind of like a Boy Scout badge program to me. <laughs> Let me ask if Brother Ted is uh, able to speak at this point. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Wow, you sound really good. Go ahead and talk about anything we've said so far, now that you sound good. Go ahead. Okay. Well, the uh, the whole sacrament deal is, is obviously uh, a... Uh, either a misunderstanding or a perversion uh, deliberately of, of John chapter 6 where Jesus said unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you know you have no life in you but just a few verses down you guys know that he says the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life so obviously it's a very figurative statement uh, because um, obviously Jesus wasn't uh, commending cannibalism <laughs> And he obviously wasn't advocating works for salvation. So, which brings up another point, since it's the three of us here, is uh, not only is it highly, highly figurative, and, and uh, of what he was saying, you have to receive me, you have to really take me in. But uh, he also said in that same pa passage that, that the Catholics quote, "Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you." To me, that's a that's a proof text for conditional immortality. You don't have the lasting life. Uh, I had never thought of it like that, but I do see how you could uh, could make make that a, a supporting verse. People people have natural life, but they don't have the eternal, immortal spiritual life that Christ offers. That's true. Without him. Yeah. Now the three of us are in agreement that a person is not uh, born immortal. Uh, we're born as mortals. We're going to do a study on this separately sometime and get very, very thorough on this. But the Bible does teach that uh, uh, mankind is not immortal. We must get become immortal through our faith in Jesus. That the only people who are immortal, who mean will have eternal life, uh, are those people who put their faith in Jesus. So I can see how you could use that verse in that way. I never, I had never connected like that, brother Evan. Have you thought of that before? No, I, I really. Well, I mean. Uh, eternal life versus the life, uh, the flesh. I mean, there's passages in the Bible that say, you know, the flesh is a, is no good thing, and you know, the flesh is going to die, and it's the spirit that lives, and, and, and to God, and you get a. Then Paul wrote, of course, that we receive a new heavenly body. But exactly the way he put it, no, I hadn't really thought thought of it exactly that way. So that was uh, that was an interesting observation. Well, it just so happens that uh, that portion, the end of chapter 6 in John, is what, what I studied, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, in, in the study on John. Uh, so that's very fresh in my mind, and that's you, the way you ex explained it is, is perfectly correct. Is The problem they had uh, in all of John, up to that point, first with Nicodemus, uh, he thought that, Jesus should be taken literally. What? I, I, how can I get back into my mother's womb? Uh, 
Um, and he, he said, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be a teacher in Israel. You don't understand spiritual talk, you know. Uh, and then he same thing with the woman at the well. She didn't understand the idea of living water. Uh, and, and then these people here that all left Jesus because they, they thought that he was telling them to be cannibals, literally eat his flesh and drink his blood. And he said, this is spiritual talk here. So, and this is the problem with the early church. Uh, people think that this is limited to Roman Catholicism, but these errors of the sacraments, they came before Roman Catholicism became into official existence. We find this in the, in the second, third centuries, the idea of, of baptism regeneration through baptism and and uh, the need for the sacrament of the, the, uh, the communion uh, as that, that's an error that happened very early in church history. I'm going to go to the next um, subject but see if you have any final remarks on that before I move on. No. Okay the next one is Pelagianism and uh, this is a 5th century heresy. It's named after Pelagius. He lived from 354 to 360, um, or it also says, or, uh, or from 420 to 440. So there must be some kind of a, con a disagreement about the exact period he lived. Pelagius was a Welsh monk. He taught that humanity does not inherit original sin, and that Salvation is earned by following the example of Christ. Grace is not necessary. Instead, humans overcome the sin they gradually develop by using God's grace to assist them in perfecting themselves and thus earning salvation. Um, there's more I want to read about this, but first just let me get your reaction to that initial remark there. Uh, I have to apologize. I had stepped away from my computer a second. I didn't really hear that. I'm sorry. Brother, Brother Ted, uh, were, you, were you able to comment on that? And then maybe Neff can go after you. Well, I, I guess I basically know just from what I've heard just from you and maybe one or two comments in the last year or so about what Pelagianism is. Um, I do have probably a, a minority view on uh, on the topic of sin nature. Um, I, I I believe that people are born. Uh, this, this may sound like splitting hairs, but at least at this point in my studies, and I could be wrong, and I'm welcome to be corrected. Um, uh, but at, at this point in my studies, I, I'm believing that people are born. With a with a uh, what you'd call a fallen nature or or an incomplete nature, but not necessarily uh, a sin nature. And I can elaborate a little if you want me to. Well, uh, I think Neff probably understands what we're talking about now. The the heresy of Pelagianism, and there's there's two things that basically were were. Uh, mentioned so far that I, I want to get your opinion on. Okay. One is that that man does was not inherit original sin, mm -hmm. uh, and two that man can uh, man did not get salvation through grace at all. He mm -hmm. earns it through uh, growing and maturing and becoming a a good person. Now, obviously, we know that's false, but would you let me get your quick thoughts on on, on that? Um. I, I kind of agree with Tedford uh, on uh, original sin. Uh, uh, since the Bible teaches that one person is not guilty for the sin of another, as God says in, in Numbers and Deuteronomy, then I, I don't see how I can be held responsible for Adam's sin. But a sinful nature, that that's where it gets a little muddy. I don't think anybody has adequately explained what it means, this idea of that we are inherited from Adam, some sinful nature. I, I, I really, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand that concept very well. I really, uh, it, it stumps me. Well, let, let me first, just for anybody watching the video, I want to declare that, um, that the, the three of us, 
and and more importantly, the Bible itself is very very explicit that salvation is, comes by the grace of God through faith alone in Christ alone. It's a it's a a free gift that's offered to everyone. It's not through uh, personal merit. It's not by overcoming our sin and become and uh, earning salvation as Pelagius taught. So that's the first thing that's easy to dispute because our everything we teach, our whole ministries and everything we teach from the Bible is based upon that doctrine of sola fide, faith alone, grace alone. Uh, so, but. Let, that gets us to the other question of the um, original sin. Now, I guess it just depends on how you define it and, and express it, but I'll give you my, my quick thoughts of it, and I'd like your feedback before we, we move on. But um, I don't – I look at it as when, when Adam and Eve fell, um, they died that day. Uh, but we know they lived – Eight nine hundred years after that, and yet it says they died that day, and we know that the Bible says that uh, it was a spiritual death. Uh, so the way I look at this is when God brought them to life and breathed into them, they they had the Holy Spirit in them, and then when they they fell, the Holy Spirit withdrew, and now they're left with a stub. It's like if you if you um, God didn't kill them. Like some people think that. Uh, well, they sinned, so God mm -hmm. sentenced them to death and killed them. But no, God didn't do that. God just told them the facts. He says, the way that I've created everything is you need to be connected to, to God through the, through the tree of life. And if you, if you get disconnected from that, you're going to die. Now, they didn't die that day, but spiritually, the spirit was severed, and now they're left with a stub. It's like pulling a leaf off of a tree, or if a, uh, you know the, the leaf's alive, but once it's pulled off, it's only a matter of time before it withers and dies because it's not connected to the tree any longer. Like a piece of, uh, like a piece of uh, perforated paper, it easily rips and leaves part of itself behind, but the other part is gone. Yeah. So this is this is what happened to Adam and Eve. Now, how does that affect us? Uh, I think it's it's a it, it, it's a genetic uh, uh, condition that they got at that moment. It's like they were exposed to radiation, and now the genetic message is, is changed and mutated. And now they have a gene that they pass on to us that it's a birth defect. It's a genetic defect, and it and it, it, it and it is a sin nature. Mm -hmm. And it comes natural. Everybody's going to sin if they live long enough. Uh, so um, I don't look at it as uh, we have the sin of Adam and Eve. It's just that we've inherited this condition, this condition, and we we cannot live a perfect life because we have a nature that will will naturally sin. It's sin nature means we sin naturally. Let me get your reaction to that. Well, I agree. I think you explained it beautifully well. In fact, uh, that sounds like the best explanation of it I have yet heard. I, I, I think there's further support from that in creation itself. And I think creation is, uh, I'm not going to try to turn this conversation into one about creation, but I think it's important for Christians to learn and understand that God's word is true when he says he created the worlds, he created the earth, he created life, because I see evidence that supports what you're saying in the creation it, itself. You know, scientists, uh, creationist scientists at the very, at, at least acknowledge that uh, the according to uh, what we observe about the uh, matter and energy and whatnot, the universe is dying. It's dying a heat death. It's going to, it, the energy is becoming evenly dispersed everywhere. Uh, all organic life is in decay. Genetic mutation is destroying every living thing on this planet. The rate at which mutations are accruing in our DNA means we cannot have lived, been around for tens of thousands of years. We're going extinct because of mutation. And we have an aging process that I think came into play when when you say uh, God withdrew his Holy Spirit from the world. He also, our, our bodies began to function imperfectly, and now we have an aging process. And so we're, 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 we're going to physically die as well. So I, I see that as true. When you say God withdrew his Holy Spirit from man, I see it not only as that, but even in a broader picture, God withdrew his Holy Spirit from all of creation. 
because the, the scriptures say that all of creation groans because of sin. Right? So the, I think the entire universe, all matter, all energy, all organic life is, is, has, is now experiencing entropy, which it was not experiencing until God did this. And that means the whole of all of creation is falling into decay, and that would include man. Uh, yeah, I, I, while, we, while we're on that subject, you're, you're right in that we don't want to go off too far into creationism tonight. It's not the, the, the theme of the show, but uh, I do want Ted, if you're not aware of this, and anybody watching the video, I want you to be aware that uh, Brother Evan, his channel is titled Nephilim Free, and uh, I believe, at, you know, he, he probably is, gets embarrassed the way I flatter him, I keep bringing this up, but I don't know anybody, uh, Kent Hovern, uh, Ken Ham, none of these people can compare to Brother Evan in terms of uh, defending the creation account in the Bible against um, Darwinism and, create, and defending theism against atheism. He also does a very good job at arguing against Calvinism and other things. So, so he's he's very very knowledgeable. So I hope you will subscribe to his channel, particularly for the, that subject matter. Um, but let me ask Brother Ted to comment on what we've said so far. Well, um, <clears throat> I would agree um, with what he said there. I I do think that uh, Adam and Eve did have the Holy Spirit living in them the way God created them. He breathed into them the breath of life. And I don't think that uh, initial creation uh, was only just uh, them living, but somehow uh, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit in them. I can't see God uh, creating them only two-thirds complete, you know, body and mind or, or body and you know, soul or what you know the uh, the immaterial thinking, contemplating part of man. I also think that God, even though it maybe not directly says in the text there that they had the Holy Spirit in them, but I would think that they did because uh, you know the analogy has been made before that uh, you know what caused the Spirit of God to depart from Adam and Eve? Well, sin. Well, <clears throat> what caused uh, Jesus uh, spirit spirit that was in him to depart from him that only happened one time on the cross where he said father into thy hands I commit my spirit you know um, so Christ became sin sin was the only thing that caused the spirit to depart from Adam and Eve sin was the only thing that caused you know the spirit to quote depart from Christ and uh, and now since cross is finished and you know going back to eternal security which you brought up a few minutes ago sin can't make the spirit depart from us because we've been forgiven it's been complete and uh, Christ resides with us eternally as far as the sin nature that you and Evan both touched on I believe it's it's kind of a thing of semantics about what I'm about to say but maybe not and uh, like I said before I don't think a baby is born with a sin nature, but I think he's born uh, uh, without the Holy Spirit, so to speak, and um, so therefore the baby's born incomplete. And I think more than being prone to sin, I think uh, a child, a human, is born prone to independence because they don't have the Spirit of God, and so therefore being prone to prone to independence. What follows an independent spirit? You know, uh, a, des a desire to be independent and get our own needs met, and that leads to sin. So I'm, I may be splitting hairs there, but I think it's kind of important. I don't believe we inherited the sin of Adam like the Calvinists believe. I don't believe that all of humanity inherited his penal his sin. The only penalty we inherited is death. Death passed upon all men. We're all going to die. So that's all I have to say on that. I think that was beautifully said, Tedford. Uh, that was right on the money. I, I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I, uh, my thoughts are in alignment with yours on that matter 100%. I think you're spot on. Yeah, I, I agree too, but that leads me to a question. The uh, um, We are 
kind of a, a unique threesome here, in that in that we are all in agreement that uh, eternal torment is, is error, uh, and, and we believe that um, in uh, people are not in, innately immortal. They must receive immortality when by putting their faith in Jesus. And so that's why I probably have a different perspective on what I'm going to say say next. And I, I think it it fits. It will fit along with everything you've said. The question is, does a person go to hell because of what they do, or do they go to hell because of what they are? And I. I believe it's because of what we are, not what we do. Because what we do is is already resolved. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, so we don't go to hell because of sin, since Jesus paid for the, the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it, um, heaven and hell is not decided by who sins or doesn't sin. It is, it's decided by who believes and who's regenerated because of their belief or not. So the problem with uh, the child, the person that's born, uh, they are um, born with this sentence of death, as you said, uh, this mortality. And unless they, uh, unless they change that, who they are, from mortal to immortal, by putting their faith in Jesus, then they are, they are doomed to, to die. Not only the first death that we know we, we all die after 60, 70, 80 years, we are going to die. But we know that, that the judgment, that those who did not receive life everlasting, they, 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 they are mortal and they will die. And uh, the, to, to us, we agree that the lake of fire is not, uh, uh, they're not there because of their punishing for their sins since Jesus died for sins. They're there because they are... Uh, uh, mortal and they die. I look at the lake of fire as just a cremation, and I don't. I don't know if it's a lake of fire that they go in there, or if it's uh, the judgments on the earth. And then when God destroys the heavens and the earth with fervent fire, if they're just burned up at that time. But regardless, these people will be consumed with this lake in this lake of fire because they are have not received life everlasting by believing in Jesus. So. I don't. I might have gone a little more than I wanted on that, but so the question is: Do you agree that people are 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 lost not because of what they do, but because of what they are? I, I, in comparison to the well, in considering what the gospel says about salvation, I would agree. Yes, because all our sins are hidden in Christ. The saved, the, the sins of the saved are hidden in Christ. So it's not about what you do; it's about who you are, Mr. Not in Christ, yeah. Uh, one point about the lake of fire. I, I don't know that I'm right about this. I've been thinking lately that the lake of fire might be, you know, the Bible in Old and New Testament say that God, our God is a consuming fire, both Hebrews and, uh, what, or I forgot which Old Testament. I, I think it's the holiness of God himself that sets the universe on fire and destroys it. And of course we know the passages that say the entire universe will be consumed, uh, all of it. And so uh, Second Peter, I think, tells us that. And I think this idea of lake of fire could be the idea, the understanding that uh, all of creation, it's not like God's just going to burn the earth. Like all of the entire universe will, be, will, will set on fire. Matter and energy will will dissipate, disappear, break down in some kind of a way that will be could be considered fire, and and it will be it will literally can be consumed, and so I don't think that when when God destroys the earth, He's just going to you know the earth and then the rest of the universe remains. The Bible says all the universe will will burn away in fervent heat. The very elements it's comprised of. So I think the lake of fire might be some uh, considering a lake as a surface. Uh, it might be considering, it might be God's way of saying, the three-dimensional realm that I created, it, the whole thing, everything in it will burn. But that's just uh, a side thought. All right, Brother Ted, what's your thoughts on all this? Well, I, I do believe that, uh, <clears throat> I believe it says in Second Peter where it says that, uh, that all the elements are going to melt 
with fervent heat, uh, excess heat, and uh, I believe it's going to be right down to the very uh, molecular structures, all the elements. You know, I believe even the the elements in the in the tiniest particles. Um, that's why there's going to be no place left for the lost to be, in my opinion. They're going to be um, they're going to be destroyed. I'm looking at Revelation 21:8 right now. Uh, it says, uh, "But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sor sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death." You know, the traditionalists would have us believe that that lake of fire and hell are the same thing. They're not, obviously, because a few verses up there, it's <laughs> clearly death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. It's something that's consuming, uh, whether it's uh, Gehenna, southwest of Jerusalem, or whatever, uh, you know, the lost are going to be completely consumed and burned up. And if he can uncreate the universe, which he's going to, which he's going to burn up all the elements, he certainly isn't going to leave anything left of the lost, from from what I can see in Scripture. Amen. I would like I would point out also that that passage where it says, you know, the liars, unbelievers, the whoremongers, the the, the thieves, uh, they will all be consumed. This is not the. This is obviously the unsaved because, as we all know, we're, we're all guilty of some of those sins right. ourselves. Right. Okay. Well, uh, we could easily just continue talking on about that subject probably for several hours and I hope we will do that at some point in the future here but um, I've looked to hit up my notes and there's a couple of more heresies but uh, that I was going to discuss but to me they are so minor in comparison that uh, I, I don't think there's any really even need to, to go into those uh, so I want to just or kind of recap some of the most serious ones and get your reaction to that and then we can be uh, be finished um, okay the the first one that I talked about uh, I will say is the worst of all um, and it's and it's similar to Pelagianism but it, it predates Pelagianism and that's um, a Judaizers we find the Judaizers uh, in the uh, uh, Book of Acts and in the uh, and the Book of Galatians. These are the people that were introducing this. And this, by the way, this is not the second and third and fourth century, as we discussed some of these other things. This is in the first century, right in the in the beginnings of the church. And the the Judaizers were they were the Jews that believed in Jesus before Gentiles even heard about it and they they basically uh, made two big mistakes the, the uh, James the, the the leader of the church in Jerusalem and uh, the, the first believers who were all Jewish they didn't understand that uh, one that Jesus didn't come for just Israel and the Jews he came to save the whole world, so Gentiles are going to be included. That's what Paul revealed as the mystery. Uh, and then they also didn't realize that Judaism had to be discarded. They thought that, okay, they're going to believe in Jesus, and, and they're going to continue practicing Judaism. But they, one by one, uh, first of all, the, the uh, dietary laws were ruled out when, when Paul... Uh, I mean, uh, when Peter went to Cornelius, God gave him a vision saying these things are not unclean. So that removed the dietary laws. And then the circumcision was was uh, addressed. And they said, well, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. They tried to impose all these things on. And then the Judaizers would come into Galatia, and they were trying to tell the believers there, you've got to practice all the laws of Moses, uh, all of Judaism. And, and Paul argued against that and said and then in the book of Hebrews I believe Paul wrote it also and he takes it a step further and says not only do you have to stop practicing all the laws but you've got to stop practicing the sacrifices Jesus made the, his sacrifice it was one final sacrifice if you do any more sacrifices you're like putting Christ on the cross again so these Judaizers are the ones that uh, trample on the cross and, and, and said that that's not enough you're going to also have to be religious. 
And so that was the first most serious a heresy, and that's a heresy that's persisted through all the centuries, and I deal with it every day here on YouTube. So let me get your first reaction to the Judaizers, and it basically they're the Lordship Salvations today. Go ahead, Chapter. Well, I can uh, certainly attest to that, uh, seen firsthand what Lordship Salvation could do. I, I was kind of sucked into it for a while in my early years of being saved. Um, my wife and I went, moved out to California. We became members of John MacArthur's church, who's probably the biggest, or well, or the most well-known proponent of what's called Lordship Salvation. Um, and it, uh, and it's interesting, Brother Luke. I think you and I have talked about this before that Lordship Salvation is almost uh, always tied in with Calvinism, because it's tied in with the uh, the P of the acronym. Perseverance of the Saints, uh, which uh, means that the, the true saints of God, that God has chosen against their will, <laughs> will continue to persevere in faith and works, uh, you know, regardless of whatever. So it's, um, it is a big problem and it is pervasive today in the body of Christ. Yeah, it, it, Judaism also uh, isn't it pretty much uh, following the law, works-based uh, kind of a thing. Uh, you know, keeping keeping the law and all that. Of course, we know that keeping the law of God won't save you. It's by grace alone we are because of our faith in Christ. So, it is uh, as I understand Judaism. It's it's all about uh, self righteousness and, and keeping the law and and you know uh, th this is one of the reasons that uh, Jesus uh, called the Pharisees uh, vipers and because they they puffed themselves up uh, and the truth is they should have been on their knees uh, pleading for salvation themselves instead of making themselves look like some kind of uh, ro royal uh, uh, law keepers so yeah so. Um, it, it, we saw the beginnings of it in the very beginnings of the church um, and, and this this heresy of faith in Jesus is insufficient you must be religious too whether it's practicing mosaic laws or, the, uh, or whether it's uh, uh, being a lordship salvationist or a legalist or following the commandments that we see here all these things today this heresy has persisted and it has really taken over the church almost all people in the so-called church throughout all of history and today uh, they do not believe as we do and as the Bible teaches that salvation comes by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone um, so that's the first most serious uh, heresy and it persists today now the next, I'm only picking out the ones that are most serious. I'm not going to recap each one of these. Um, we've got uh, um, Martianism, um, uh, Docetism, uh, Gnosticism. These are all kind of related in that in that they think that the the physical universe is evil, and therefore uh, uh, Jesus uh, could not be a physical. They deny his uh, physical existence, and that means that they they did de de deny his death on the cross and his bodily resurrection. So you can't be saved if Jesus didn't literally really die for our sins and, and be raised from the dead. So uh, those are all different forms of the same problem. And uh, uh, so let me get your response to that. Okay. No, go ahead. Well, I didn't hear it all, but um, I, I, it sounds like what that uh, uh, belief system, I forget what Luke just termed it, but it sounds like it's saying the cross is not sufficient for forgiveness. And uh, do, isn't that where uh, ritualism ties all in, ceremonialism, Brother Luke? Well, uh, let, me, let me clarify it. It's not that the cross is not sufficient. It's just that it never happened. It was uh, Jesus's physical existence was a, an illusion. He didn't really have a body. Oh, Therefore, okay. 
he couldn't have really died on the cross and he couldn't wasn't really bodily resurrected and so how does that affect our, our theology and salvation brother um, well uh, the, the, ver the verse that comes to my mind is uh, when Jesus you know his post resurrection appearances he said uh, touch me and handle me for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as I have even and when he said to Thomas uh, uh, put your fingers here thrust your hand into my side stop your doubting and believe so obviously he was truly physical this is another reason uh, this kind of ties back into the whole uh, sin nature thing all the Gnostics from what I've understood from the uh, historians the, the Gnostics problem was they believed that all matter was evil so therefore you know God couldn't come in the flesh you know spirit had to be separate from flesh Jesus could never you know really be manifest in the flesh and that's the Gnostics of the day believed that all matter was evil well the the religious religionists of our day believe in a sense all matter is evil because uh, <laughs> it kind of goes back to what I was saying that's that's why they, they believe everybody's born with a sin nature instead of I, I make the distinction that we're born kind of fallen fallen nature rather than a sin nature doesn't mean our matter doesn't mean our matter is evil it just means we're fallen so I I think we've got some Gnostics around us today <laughs> of course I could be wrong but it seems like it to me hmm. yeah that, that the idea that you know just uh, Calvinism does seem to be tied into a number of, of, of false teachings doesn't it brother Luke when it, you, we often find just like a maze sort of you know uh, you find one heresy you trace it back to its root oh it's connected to Calvinism oh this oh that's connected to Calvinism too or oh, what about oh yeah that one too it, it's it's kind of strange that uh, you know a core belief that's wrong will lead to a various wrong ideas I guess okay then uh, the next uh, problem that I think it is rise to a, a level that is quite serious is adoptionism and that is that they they believe that uh, Jesus um, uh, he was not God he was just an ordinary man who was able to be so good and live such a perfect life that that uh, he was able to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and gave him a kind of a minor God status he was adopted as a son of God uh, you know that we are adopted as the Son of God because that, that's what how the Bible says a, a, a Christian it, it becomes a Christian through adoption but they say that Jesus was adopted he, he was not eternal God Almighty so that's another one that denies the uh, deity and the eternality of Jesus uh, and uh, so let me get your response to that real quick well, the Bible is so absolutely clear that Jesus Christ is God. I mean, Testament, New Testament, it's all throughout the entire Bible. It's all about Jesus Christ. When God told uh, Moses to, uh, uh, was it Moses or Abraham, uh, to uh, uh, tell the tribes of Israel according to their numbers to arrange themselves in a specific uh, encampment, you know, this tribe north, this to the east, make your tents to the south, it formed the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, what, 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 you know, how much more evidence do you need that the entire Bible is all about Christ? So, uh, the de anything that denies the deity of Christ is, is utter heresy. It's just complete nonsense. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. I don't remember if Brother Ted comment on that or not, but on adoptionism? Well, I don't... <clears throat> It, that that would be a it would be another Christ and it would be it would be an accursed message from what I can from what I can tell I mean Galatians 1 8 and 9 uh, where Paul says if any man preach any other gospel let him be accursed. to me that's that's not good news it's an accursed message uh, was in it second Corinthians uh, 13 brother where he says uh, you know someone comes to you preaching another Jesus and, and and you re, you know you're receiving another spirit. It, it's um, it's truly not the true Christ. So it's got to be, and a, a Jesus of adoption is not an eternal Jesus. So 
Yeah, and uh, this is a very really common viewpoint of much of the, the liberal religions, like the New Age thought, too, that Jesus is, was a man who was uh, attained a high uh, uh, spirituality. Um, the next one is... Uh, um, now, uh, Sabellianism, uh, more commonly called modalism, this is something that was a serious dispute in the first few centuries of the church when, when they were all trying to argue over and define the Godhead. And Sabell modalism, to me, is not a damnable heresy. It, I can accept a modalist as a brother. Um, you know, if you, you'll have to decide that for yourself if it's uh, if you're that uh, uh, liberal about it or not. But uh, modalism uh, 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 does agree with, to me, the, the most important thing that we need to understand about Jesus, um, that, and that is that he is eternal. He is eternal God Almighty. The difference is that I see um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, being three distinct persons and yet one God in a traditional Trinitarian triunity unity, uh, 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 description of the Godhead, uh, but the modalist says no. There's Jesus is is eternal God Almighty. It's just that sometimes he wears the mask of, of the Father and sometimes he wears the mask of the Holy Spirit. He's just changing costumes or modes of operation. But they give him credit for being eternal God Almighty. And to me, maybe I'm just too lenient on this, but I, I can accept that and I, I can live with that. Um, what's your reaction to that one? I'm neither a modalist. Uh, I am. Not, I don't consider myself a modalist because I, I I don't look at it like God changing costumes or masks. I look at it uh, I that uh, all three are God, and I think the true nature of God is absolute is actually impossible man to understand that's why there is even controversy about it and people take up camps about it is because we just struggle to try to understand that and for me I I'm just satisfied believing that all three are God that's that's really the only thing I I I, I uh, that's my my position on it you know whether I'm right or a little bit less right than somebody else, or a little more right about somebody else about the nature of God. I really don't care uh, because uh, I believe what I what I need to believe to know the truth about God, and that is that He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all three of those are fully God, and that the entirety of the Godhead existed in Jesus Christ. So uh, that really is the core thing, and I I really don't think that it's really highly productive for people to debate the nature of God. Let's just accept that he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The, the rest of that, as it goes deeper into the nature of God, it's going to go into a murky darkness that man will never be able to see through, no matter what kind of flashlight he brings with him. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with what Evan says there. I mean, who even uh, can, can really describe the full nature of God. He's, he's beyond our understanding. I just think it's essential that people believe in the deity of Christ and um, and even that's hard for some people to understand um, you know uh, even you know believing that he's the Christ the Messiah the Son of God you know you show him from the Old Testament that uh, uh, comparing with John 8 you know where he's claiming to be the great I am I think true believers I think people are going to see that you know, deity and triunity is, is hard for some people to understand. And I believe that there are some modalists that definitely are Christians. I, you know, I, I'm not going to say that they're not saved. I, I just think that's it's wrong for some Trinitarians to say that, that you know, there's no way they're saved. You know, I, listen, you know, you know, I just, I think that's going too far. Yeah, I'm... Um... I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I know some people that, that are really um, abhor uh, modalism and modalists, uh, but uh, it was several centuries in the, after the apostles had left us the, the New Testament, uh, several centuries of, of, in the church afterwards, that they, they were 
debating and writing and having councils trying to define what we're trying to explain here in a few minutes. Volumes were written and there were a lot of arguments. There were councils and creeds. Uh, the, the Nicene Creed, the, the revised Nicene Creed in Constantinople, uh, the uh, 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 Chalcedonian Creed, the Athanasian Creed. Over several centuries, all these councils and creeds, they, they gradually wrote more and more and declared more and more, st stating how to describe what we're trying to describe. And so, uh, um, it's, in other words, that just verifies the point that it took centuries of debate and writing to look to be try to put it in the best into words the best they could <laughs> and still we're kind of struggling with how to understand and explain it but I do think that it is essential to understand that Jesus is eternal God he's not a creature right. it's essential to understand that he did have a, a body he was a man with a body of flesh and blood because otherwise he couldn't have died for his sins and raised from the dead uh, let's say uh, hi, brother Neil. Hello, okay. as usual. A pleasure as usual. Yes. Mm. Okay. Well, we're summing up the study here, but I'm glad you could join us at least here for the the final uh, remarks here. Now, so that was a modalism. Then we talked about Arianism and the problem with with um, Arianism is it, it, it denies exactly what we said, that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Arianism says Jesus is a creature. And then we discussed Pelagianism, and it just says that, that uh, we're not saved by grace at all. We're saved through personal merit, and everybody could has the ability to be good enough if they try hard enough. So those are the big, serious heresies. There are others. Some of them I have on my list. I'm not going to go through because I don't think they rise to that level of uh, significance. But um, so I kind of went back and, and, and summarized some of the ones I did in the first study since you guys weren't here with me. But let me get kind of your conclusions on the, the whole subject of these early church heresies uh, so far. Tipper, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, I think I think what happens is when these uh, these guys uh, go to something other than scripture, and they go uh, into what we now deem as heresies. Uh, you look back at the roots of them; they weren't uh, they weren't having the Bible as their final authorities. And I realize uh, maybe a lot of them didn't have the Bible, didn't have the uh, the canon complete as we have it nowadays and so uh, maybe they did maybe Luke can tell us uh, what, what, were the, what were the dates of some of these uh, heresies when they came along who started them maybe they didn't have the Bible regionally maybe only uh, people in uh, liturgical positions uh, had them maybe none of the none of the laymen had these and maybe that's why some of these things were embraced or widely accepted uh, but uh, you know, I, I go back to John 17 where Christ, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. <laughs> thy word is truth. Got to be the final authority. Yeah, and there you go at the philosophers. Yeah, philosophy and the, uh, and pagan religions. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I, I just, as you noticed, I pasted two passages in the Bible which use the word philosophy, the only two that do, I think. In the King James, anyway, and uh, and 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 the Greeks were asking, well, "What kind of numbskull is this Jesus? What kind of uh, garbage is he preaching?" You know, th are these you know, they don't understand this because they're stuck in their vain philosophy. And then we have Colossians said, "Beware lest any man." Well, it wasn't Jesus speaking it, uh, in the first one. Uh, it was uh, one of the apostles, probably Paul, I, I guess, uh, because he was preaching Jesus. But then there's beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the limits of the world, and not after Christ. So, you know, what you're, you're absolutely right. When people dig into their philosophy, they get up in their head. They think, you know, look, I'm able to reason away. Listen to me. I can teach you some things. And and they they use their they get prideful about their knowledge about their what they consider to be wisdom, and uh, and so they rely on that. And like you said, instead of scripture, and that's their big error. 
Well, I, I think that the, one of the important things that we should learn from this particular stu study is that um, some of these worst heresies, like Judaism and, and uh, I'm Judaizers, Lordship Salvation is the version of it today, uh, and Pelagianism, that you can work your way to heaven, these things, um, they go back not just even to the second, third, fourth centuries, they go back to the first century, even at the time the the epistles were written. Um, I'll read this one verse here, Second uh, Peter 2, 1 and 2. Uh, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring up upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Um, so uh, some of these heresies that we see today are so ancient, they go back even at the time of the apostles, and then some of them sprung up in the second and third and fourth centuries. Uh, but in my statement of faith, the kind of the creed that I wrote based upon what I think is really essential, really emphasizes two things, that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. That that argues that he's not simply a creature, and that and that um, and that salvation is not by works at all. It's a completely a free gift offered to everyone, and you receive it through faith alone in Christ alone. To me, these are the two most important things for a person to comprehend and embrace: this deity of Christ, because he he can't be savior if he's not God, and and uh, the idea that salvation is free gift. Um, so, uh, Brother Neil, you haven't, I don't know how much you've heard of this tonight, but I'll give you a chance to say anything if, uh, ba based on what you've heard. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I was listening to you earlier today also. Man, did you, uh, did you come at some of them guys that were saying some of the stuff, you know, the, the, those, I can't say, I can't remember exactly what you said, but you said something about these guys that put themselves up on pedestals as, as if they know uh, more than everybody else, like it's a secret is the word that you used. You said there's some kind of secret that they have and they know that you don't know. And that's, I think that's the biggest problem with a lot of these uh, people. But yeah, other than that, that's all I had to say. Yeah, yeah that was a, a good uh, hangout we had earlier today with uh, uh, talking to the people about their, their, for some reason, many people feel it's, uh, they have a great need to uh, evaluate other Christians and, and judge whether they are truly saved or not, and they're judging them based upon their how much their life has changed. And so that was the subject of that that video, but uh, that that uh, discussion. But uh, uh, let me see. Did I ask? Uh, let me see, Brother Ted. You gave your final remarks, Brother Evan. Did you? I, I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Ted gave it, it talked about uh, how people make the error of not putting scripture as the highest authority, and I concurred with him, and mentioned uh, the philosophers and their, uh, and uh, so yeah, I guess I did. Yeah. All right. Well, at the end of every every one of these broadcasts, I I, I don't want to fail uh, in doing what's really most important, and and that is telling the viewer the good news, uh, the gospel. Uh, gospel is a Greek word, it means good news, and it really shouldn't be good news, it should be great news, it really should be the greatest news ever told, and, and, and it is simply that, that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to all of us, to everyone, as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Now, if that shocks you, if you haven't heard that before, and you think that's really, wow, that's, that's bizarre, that's I've never heard that. Well, I'm not surprised because uh, almost all the people in the world today, even in churches all across the world today, and, and even throughout all of history, they've been teaching a lie from the devil that, that in order to go to heaven, it is determined by how good a person is. If you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. If you're not good enough, particularly if you're a bad person, then you're going to go to hell. It's all based on personal merit. That's what the world has been taught, and it's an evil, damnable lie. 
And the, the truth is, to go to heaven, it's impossible to get there on your personal merit because you'd have to be able to go before God and say, I've never done one thing wrong my whole life. I'm perfect. Because that's the standard you have to meet according to the Bible. And we all fall short. No one can, can legitimately claim they've been perfect their whole life. Uh, so that's, that's uh, evident there that we need, we need to be helped. We need to be saved. And God intervened on our behalf and said, man is in a hopeless situation. He could never reach the level to qualify for heaven on his own. So God intervened. It's kind of like he did an intervention on our behalf. And it says that uh, uh, God became flesh. He came down from heaven and manifested in the flesh as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in order so that he could die on a cross and pay for our sins. And he, in fact, did it. He paid for all of our sins, so now we can go before God and we're sinless because Jesus paid for our sins. Uh, and, and then if, when we put our faith in Jesus to, as our Savior, he regenerates us. He gives us life everlasting as a free gift and so that uh, we know that we're not only we're saved from condemnation, but we get to live forever in joy and bliss in heaven. So uh, he died for our sins. He was buried, but the, the, the most uh, remarkable thing is Jesus raised himself back to life bodily. And, and that, that's proven because uh, he walked among 500 witnesses for over four, for 40 days, and they, they saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And that bodily resurrection was Jesus' way of, of giving us a sign, a proof that he is God, that he is Savior, that he does have power over life and death. And it's the resurrection that gives me confidence that my faith in Jesus is justified. And Jesus actually promises us all, you, you're going to go to heaven if you trust me. So since God can't break a promise, I'm guaranteed I'm going to go to heaven. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me. I'll pull, I hope you'll put your faith in Jesus now and receive the gift of eternal life in heaven. I'll give everybody a moment to, to say any final words and then we'll close. Go. Good hangout. I like. Yeah. I, I think it's informative to share this, this these things with other people, so they can learn about these heresies and and maybe compare something that they've been uh, fallen into believing, and they can say, "Oh, look, this is where it came from, and this is how it's wrong." So I think I commend you for doing it. I think it's a great idea for people to learn about these things. Yeah, thanks, Brother Luke, for uh, bringing these uh, things that it always seems like history repeats itself, doesn't it? We have to have to watch these same errors, you know, cropping up now and again throughout history, and so uh, it's good for us to be aware of it. Thank you for leading that study. Good job. Excellent hangout as usual. I am here sometimes daily, weekly. I don't know, but yeah, it's always it's always good though. I love the stuff about. Uh, like me and Neff were talking about in the side chat. It's not a secret. It's it's out of the bag, uh, Evan said. It, it, it's it's not supposed to be. Everybody should know this, you know. And it doesn't take us to tell them that. They they should just know, you know. What I'm <laughs> All right. Uh, I I appreciate uh, you joining me in this discussion, and uh, I look forward to more of them. Um, I I will give uh, the audience uh, viewers a teaser. Uh, uh, Brother Ted and Brother Evan and I are going to do a hangout at some point in the future, and the subject will be we're arguing against eternal torment in hell, arguing for conditional immortality and annihilationism. Uh, we all agree on that, and so we're going to tell you why we are persuaded there is no eternal torment in hell. So um, I don't know when we're going to do it, but I'm looking forward to it. And uh, Thank you, everybody, for participating. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.